Guys, let's just be honest. Just about every game would be better if it was set in outer space. Seth knows this, and that's why today we are checking out Endless Space 2 Jingo is Joy Edition from Seth Zentech. Let's get into it. Hey people, Seth here. Humanity. One day, we will inevitably reach the stars and one- Ugh. It's not inevitable, dude. We're probably more likely to nuke each other out of existence or just continually self-sabotage so that we have periods of growth and then self-sabotage ourselves back down to uh, a lesser organized age. See, also, the space program. We landed on the moon, an extraterrestrial body, and then for 70 years, we just sort of self-sabotaged ourselves with greed and stupidity. Guys, I want to thank today's video sponsor, Manscaped. Manscaped, the world leader in men's below-the-waist grooming, is back, and they are looking to upgrade your shower routine with the new Ultra Premium Collection. This all-in-one skin and hair hygiene kit is going to change your showering life. Your skin, hair, and all the other parts of you deserve this. Save 20% off and get free shipping by going to manscaped.com and using promo code VET. Link is in the description. Personally, I'm a big fan of the body wash. You can see I've already used it more than a couple times. I love the fact that it gets me clean, but it doesn't dry out my skin. I train a lot and I'm here in the Texas heat, so dry skin is a battle I am constantly fighting. And the hydrating body wash makes a huge difference. So here is the Manscaped Ultra Premium Collection shower routine. First, you want to wash yourself down with the Ultra Premium body wash. It's cologne infused with aloe vera and sea salt, so you will be smelling great and feeling clean. Next up is hair care time. You're gonna use the two-in-one shampoo and conditioner to wash your hair if you have any, or your armpits and any other body hair you have. It's a non-greasy formula with coconut oil, green tea, aloe, and turmeric, and sage. Once you're out of the shower, keep yourself smelling fresh with the Manscaped deodorant. This is aluminum free dries clear and is also cologne infused so you'll be smelling great if you have tattoos or especially dry skin you can use the manscaped moisturizing body spray and finally you can put on the manscaped lip balm this is a free gift with every purchase of the ultra premium collection and of course last but not least manscaped of course has the lawnmower 4.0 their premier flagship trimmer this is water resistant so it, you can do it right in the shower. It's designed to be used on loose skin. Thanks to their proprietary skin safe technology, it reduces the likelihood of cuts, nicks, and ingrown hairs. This bundle will change your life or at least your showering life. For 20% off and free shipping, use promo code VET at manscaped.com. It's time to upgrade your shower routine with Manscaped. And thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring today's video. One day, we will inevitably reach other intelligent, sentient, yet utterly alien races. We will shake their many appendages, engage in trade, exchange ideas, and even attempt diplomacy. But we all know, inevitably, how this has to end. Well, that went badly. This is actually an illustration of a real problem that dates back a long, long time. In fact, the first recorded history written by Thucydides describes this example in which the st state of Athens and the state of Sparta are at war, right? And Athens has in its way its own empire in the Aegean. Dozens of islands paying tribute to this city, master of the sea, and yet, despite these two states' power, they are both dwarfed by the reality that the Persian Empire to the west is the ultimate superpower and could wipe out both of those cities with ease. And so it colors the existence of the Persian Empire, colors the entire interaction between Athens and Sparta as they both try to court and deter the Persians from becoming involved in the conflict. 
Welcome to Endless Space 2. Endless Space 2 is a 4X game, which, if you're not familiar with, stands for the 4Xs. Expand, explore, and exterminate all xenomorphs before <laughs> they do the same to you. Uh, probably, you know, most likely. I've played this turn-based sci-fi strategy intensely for the better part of a month, and before that, about two years, and I must confess, it's pretty damn good. Also, there is a story, and it is absolutely critical you understand the lore of this game. In the current job market, Endless Space historians are in extremely high demand and boast starting salaries of about 300k. Most of the Fortune 500 companies hire at least two of them in order to understand what the fuck is going on. The story <laughs> is told to you through wiki articles, the accuracy of which is questionable, because I've uh, edited several articles and they still haven't caught me. In the universe of... So, this is actually a new and much very common process in games is to sort of expand the universe of the game so that you don't just learn about it inside the game itself, but you learn about it through the community, right? This is an example of Escape from Tarkov, right? In which you don't really advance the plot much in the game itself. You do some quests that kind of move forward, but that's not really advancing the plot in the same way. Instead, you get the plot through the uh, collaborative, uh, basically movie. I think it's like 45, maybe an hour long, uh, high production value movie about Escape from Tarkov. And you learn about the game through uh, mechanics, through the wiki, the official wiki. So... Again, this idea of the expansion of video game universes to include the larger internet is not necessarily new, but it is a very new trend that I think is, is honestly pretty cool. Endless Space 1 and 2, there is or was... So just like real history, sometimes if you want to learn about the lore, the histories are not always accurate. Again, the to use the earliest history Thucydides as an example, he didn't view that he was writing a historical account, or he, he thought he was, but in his mind, the facts of what happened could afford to take a backseat to good storytelling and more importantly, good moral lessons to be learned. So he wanted to demonstrate the importance of being uh, submissive before the powers of the gods and uh, as a lesson against hubris. And so he would engineer these characters to ensure that their stories were uh, captured, that moral point, right? But we also know from contemporary historical records that many of the events he described were also true, right? We know the Persians talked about the Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta. We know in the historical record that Athens did actually have the empire that Thucydides claimed it did. So there's a lot of facts that are right. And so historians, and this is true of many histories, though Thucydides is maybe the most blatant in his commitment to not recording things 100% accurately, every historical source is going to be at risk of inaccuracies. Even modern sources, if you look at like our unemployment numbers, right? We wonder like how much, how good is our methodology? It's pretty good, but it's not precise. It's just an estimate an incredibly advanced civilization called the Endless. What happened to the Endless? Well, there's less of them. The End. Roll credits. But no, they went to space and they developed technology. They revolutionized the galaxy by creating dust. Dust is used as money in Endless Space 2, which it isn't. It's an autonomous cloud computing network of nanomachines that get smarter as the cloud gets bigger. They're capable of self-assembly, self-autonomy, and farming crypto tokens at rates never before seen in the known galaxy. However, they developed a little too hard when they figured out how to upload your soul. So half of them went on to live as immortal machines running on the 5G network. These were known as the Virtual Endless. The other half, known as the Concrete Endless, considered them an abomination because it's hard to consider a sentient laptop as intelligent life, even hard. Yeah, this is sort of a debate and it's possible, right? It, it, this is actually capturing something that, that could very well be real. And here's what I'm talking about. You might think it's preposterous. You could never become a dissociated 5G network, right? And that's sort of true. But let's say, for example, you were to discover a way to create an artificial neuron, right? It's made of silica and carbon or something and you can stick it in place of uh, existing neurons in your brain and they will function exactly the same if you could do that right 
then if you could give it to an Alzheimer's patient, you could probably, for example, uh, restore some memory function, restore some cognitive function, right? But then you have to ask the question, what happens if you were to replace one for one, uh, let's say, a few hundred cells a day. You wouldn't even really notice. You might not experience any change in your cognitive ability. But over time, over a period of years, you would actually find to the point where your brain was probably mostly these artificial neurons, right? Now, let's say those artificial neurons were able to have features that our biological neurons don't. Like, let's say, again, they were able to be powered by standard electrical charges. You could plug them into a Tesla charger and, and that would power them right? If you become this technological brain, then it's possible that you may not need the body to function if the brain can again function with a Tesla charger. Uh, so it's possible then we've established that it's, it's plausible, right? And maybe even possible to become a disembodied head, to become a brain in a jar, right? If you were able to create a neuron that can sustain itself through that. Then, once you're a brain in a jar, it's an easy logical leap to sit there and say, okay, we are going to replace all of those connections, right? Every one of them, map it perfectly, just download the data right from the individual cells and map them into a virtual universe, right? And as long as those neurons in the virtual universe behave exactly like the neurons in your universe, in the real universe, then a perfect copy of you will exist in a computer, right? Which is pretty fascinating and also a little scary because like, what if it's terrifying, you know? you Yeah, brain in a jar, you don't get to see, hear, smell, talk, taste, right? There may even be hormonal things, uh, for example, uh, sexual desire, right? That's a brain process, but it's also kind of a chemical process. And if you don't have the right brain chemical mix, then it, that, that may not be able to be recreated. I, again, this is brain science. It's pretty squishy. Get it? The point is you could upload a version of your consciousness into a, a the internet, basically, into a virtual or energetic space like or non-corporeal space like the internet uh, obviously the internet is corporeal it's just a bunch of servers but you could do it the weird thing is is that it's not you that's in the internet right it's a perfect copy of you and even if you perfectly copied yourself this the very minute after it happens you will get unique experiences that will change your brain in a physical chemical way right and the brain and the internet will have also new experiences so after months and years you and internet brain might be really really different which is also sort of fascinating it's like talking to a different version of you that led a different life but you can still die and internet you can still continue on but the cool thing is that internet you would be alive in most of the senses that count so it's a fascinating sort of thought experiment, right? And when people talk about post-human or transhumanism, right, the, the electronic brain, right, the internet brain is one example. The electronic brain is another one. Because again, let's say you became just an electronic brain plugged into a Tesla charger. Well, you could say, I'd like to have a Tesla body. And you get just dropped into that stupid, poorly made electric car and drive around, potentially, right? Or you could say, I want to have six arms. I want the Dr. Octopus, you know, or I want the, I mean, T-1000 T Terminator body. You could get whatever you want. It's a pretty strange and interesting uh, potential version of being a living being that used to be a human but isn't anymore. Harder when you find out it's still running Windows Vista. Unable to reconcile their differences, the Endless decided to end each other. The Virtuals unleashed bioweapons on the concrete. The concrete sent malware to their mailbox, forcing them to run 3 billion instances of Bonzi Buddy. Needless oh. to say, they wiped each other out. The Endless came to an end. But many centuries later, other races figured out space travel, picking apart the ashes and remains of a civilization long forgotten. In the galaxy of the Endless, is 
is where our story takes place. So, what do you do in Endless Space 2? Well, you pick a spacefaring civilization and you try to win. But what is victory? Victory can be anything. Money, technology, intergalactic conquest, or even weaponizing the influence of e-girl streamers to absorb every sentient race in the galaxy. Because, as we already know, a sentient brain is still capable of falling victim to becoming a simp. The path to victory... <laughs> If they can think, they can be converted to pathetic simps. Possibly. It depends, actually, on how... So every creature... Every creature is going to have to have some sort of reproductive drive. Probably. Probably. Okay, so creatures that may not have a reproductive drive. One is some sort of emergent intelligence. This would be like if your whole planet... Like the Alpha Centauri scenario, where your whole planet or some it becomes a neural network right it achieves sentience because it becomes more and more and more and more complex and then boom suddenly it can it's a system that can think uh with a language and everything else right so it's a, a system that emerges uh from its complexity it may not have an instinctual drive it may not have any instinctual drives other than perhaps the drive to like maintain itself so like you know, in the Alpha Centauri scenario, like cultivating fungus, right? The other example would be a post, well, the alien version of being post-human. So you could sit there, and if you were able to turn your brain into a robot brain, then you could sit there and be like, uh, I don't really want to have this compulsion to reproduce. I don't, it, it's not that great, right? So you just sort of work you just sort of remove it you also could have situations like what we see sometimes today where the external inputs are such that they uh reduce people's desire to reproduce um again and this is sort of a version of post-humanism that we're into now right pre-modern man right when we lived in caves we just had a compulsion to engage in sexual activity and the Product result of that was offspring, and we had a compulsion to care for those offspring. And so you just sort of followed these instincts between reproducing and caring for offspring, and you just sort of, you know, both occurred at the same time, right? And you just sort of follow those instincts to their natural conclusions. Uh, in the modern world, we use technology to manage those things. We manage it through contraceptives, and we also manage it through knowledge. We know more about how uh, reproduction happens, and so we're able to make these choices. Combine that with the fact that we have many other outlets that speak to human needs to grow and to nurture things and to uh, achieve um, and also to experience just like joy and pleasure and fun, uh, many of which are more compelling, uh, especially when you get to make a choice about reproduction. So it's a very complex sort of blend of technologies that let human beings also choose uh, in some cases to be like, hey, I don't really want to engage in reproduction. But other than those examples, most species will have at their base some sort of reproductive drive, right? And in order, and so therefore, you could, as long as you can understand and then corrupt that drive, you can definitely achieve some sort of of simping, right? We can even actually turn some uh, chicks into simps, some birds, right? For example, we know that peacocks, male peacocks uh, or female peacocks are drawn to big, colorful displays of feathers, right? They're very dramatic displays. So if we as human beings build a, a billboard sized flashing lights and colors, no female peacock will want to go after the male peacocks. Not because a biological peacock will never compete with this artificial perfectly constructed ultra colorful billboard version of a peacock we can actually trick uh birds mother birds to feed uh worms to an artificial chick and it neglect its own chicks because the uh pink color of a of the inside of a hungry chick's mouth opening and closing we can make a bigger brighter pinker version of this and she'll give that the hungriest looking chick she'll instinctively give all her worms to. So it can, you can easily turn people into sort of weird, or animals into weird 
Simps. Tree is your own free choice. The game itself is very customizable, meaning there's no reason to pick any speed except fast, any galaxy besides ovoid, and if anyone dares pick a custom race, we are all going to collectively form a non-aggression pact and hunt you down. Starting off, you only have a single planet. Your home system is very modest, and you need to rapidly scale your operations if you hope to compete with the rest. To do so, you'll need to explore, expand, and colonize new systems. Exploration is very simple. You send an exploration vessel into the great unknown and watch as it dies to pirates. Before that happens, you'll want to find as many uncolonized systems as possible. On each planet, there's a chance of finding curiosities. These are the slow, pulsing rings you see on display. To explore a curiosity, you need to send and a probe. It's quite similar to the probe minigame from Mass Effect 2. If successful, the game will let you know, together with a small reward for finding it before anyone else. These can be anything from strategic or luxury resources, planetary anomalies, or even the start of a random quest line. The point of curiosities is to try and guess which star systems are worth colonizing. In general, any system less than three planets is garbage. Any system with only cold planets is garbage. In fact, ask enough players and you'll find that every possible possible star system ever formed by the laws of physics is still garbage. Colonize them anyway, because I like the animation that plays each time you do so. There's actually an animation for every type of planet, which I didn't know, because who the fuck colonizes a gas giant as their first choice of planet? It it's like, where are we dropping, boys? O oh yeah, on the burning gas giant. H how are we meant to walk on a gas giant? Very carefully. Anyway, I'm losing. Uh, I want to say in Pluto, in a lot of these gas giants, there is actually a solid core, but you just have to get through the, you know, tons and tons of soup, basically, to get there. Uh, but you could also colonize a gas giant through, if you were able to uh, achieve equilibrium and like a self-contained, basically a space station of some kind, uh, Bespin, the Bespin Cloud City idea, uh, you could probably make it work. Right, you'd be more likely to colonize it in orbit around the world or colonize one of its moons, right? If there was an off-world human colony right now, the leading candidates would probably be places like Titan. Uh, that's, of course, because we are most confident, like Titan and Europa, uh, are most likely to have liquid water. Losing track. You choose a star system, and you pick a more reasonable type of planet to be the base of your colony. Most factions can't settle a system immediately. They need to form an outpost, send colony support, and convince any other players contesting the system to cease their aggressive expansionism. You can do this through liberal policies, such as stealing their food supplies, or less liberal policies, also known as an interplanetary blockade, with a sole purpose of starving them to death. Typically, this is how you greet other players. Otherwise, you blast their ships out of orbit and you get sent a formal complaint, to which you respond accordingly. Diplomacy is an interesting concept. Uh, we do have other things to take care of. These are diplomatic channels, not social media. Again? Are you just lonely? Because unlike many... <laughs> okay, this is pretty funny. The sarcastic alien race is just like it's not social media. All will all anim will all aliens have social media? It depends. I think probably um, because in order to achieve space flight, it involves co you have to have a baseline instinct of coordination and cooperation, right? To do all the the basic things, right? You can't, you just keep one person, no matter how smart or big or intelligent or long living they are, cannot launch a spacecraft. Like, like they just can't do it. One biological life form couldn't do it. So you would have to have some sort of instinct for cooperating and collaborating in order to harness the collective abilities of your, your race, right? Your alien race it, to launch a space craft in a space program certainly a space empire by definition requires a lot of collaborative efforts so that means that there would have to be some sort of core instinct that says hey being th there's some sort of core instinct some social drive in those animals right or in those creatures so by that definition if you have the technology to launch spacecraft, then you also need the technology to engage in some sort of telecommunication, right? So at the very least, I don't know if we would call it social media, but we would definitely expect aliens to have some sort of ability to 
engage in long distance social contact, like a telephone, a cell phone, a uh, picture sending service, uh, something, whatever sensory inputs they use to communicate with one another, uh, they would have some sort of televersion of that. Telesmell, for example. Games of a similar nature, diplomacy is a tangible resource. In fact, everything is a resource. If you want to condense down the Endless Space 2 experience, you're going to be spending hours of your life trying to increase the five colors, green, orange, yellow, blue, and purple. Respectively, these are food, industry, dust, science, and influence, or hmm. FIDSI for short. These are the combined economic outputs of your systems. At the beginning, you don't have very much. You can't do very much, so you need more, a lot more. You need food to grow population. population Population contributes to the economy and gives you different bonuses depending on the race of that population. But a planet's base output is pathetic, so you need to build improvements. To do that, you need industry. More industry, more production. But you can't have industry without research, and you can't have research without science. Besides unique variations, every faction follows the same unified tech tree. Supporting larger industry requires dust, a lot of dust. And if you're planning to go to war, exponentially more dust. To even make the formal declaration that you're going to erase someone off the face of the galaxy, you need influence. It is the most precious resource and represents your combined political power. The bigger your influence, the bigger your sphere of influence. This game doesn't work on national borders. It works on raw intergalactic peer pressure. Have enough influence and you'll absorb everyone without even lifting a finger. Besides other players, there are also minor factions. Yep, guys, this is actually capturing a, a geopolitical reality of influence. And influence is something that a lot of countries still, the U.S. included, doesn't understand the strength of what it means to have influence. Influence includes things like the basically the desire of other factions to be around you, to interact with you, to want to be base on your good side, right? So why would someone want to be on your good side? Because you have a huge military and you don't want to be on the, you know, shooting end of that military, right? In contrast, right, if you, you want a military like that to consider you a friend and worthy of protection, you also have wealth economic influence. You don't want to preclude someone from having access to some subset of your resources through trade or just aid sharing, right? In contrast, you don't want to have this massive economic power who can outcompete you to be working against you, right? You also have cultural influence. These are sort of subjective ideas that people find uh, compelling, right? That people find engaging. And this is a really powerful and underutilized form of influence because it includes in, in the human examples, right? I don't know how it would look in an alien world, but here it includes things like movies, uh, fashion styles, production, all of this sort of squishy, subjective stuff but it can be really compelling because it forms cultural links between the countries, whether it's um, the way Bollywood copied a lot of old Hollywood musicals, right? And then put their own cultural spin on it, meaning that now there is a, a cultural thread directly between the U.S. and India, or it's things like even the use of jeans and t-shirts in places like Vietnam, right? Countries that, again, it, it were at war with the United States. And yet now if you go to Vietnam, you'll see U.S. and European fashions very widespread. It's pretty fascinating. Even things like look at hip hop and the surrounding fashion around it. That's a purely U.S. art form. And yet it's expanded to almost every country has their own hip hop artists that are making music in often their own languages. So so it's pretty cool to see the way cultural influence works and it's hard to measure the way it, it more difficult and it's also hard for governments to control right governments they only can loosely influence cultural outputs so it's hard for them to harness it but it's very powerful especially in democracies where regular people who buy fashion and care about styles and watch tv have a say in their political system did you know the nigerians govern a sector of space occupied by several different humanoid species if we say yes will you feed us one of those species is the Benkarans. They occupy just 10% of Nigerian space. 
but take up nearly 80% of the space in Nigerian prisons. Maybe they commit more crimes. These are civilizations that are advanced, yet not Oof. advanced enough to avoid assimilation. These are very diverse and can be anything from sentient jellyfish, reformed assassin droids looking for God, or even <laughs> moving chunks of coral reef remotely piloted by a sentient supercomputer the size of a planet, which in itself was formed by random chance. Minor factions exist to be absorbed by other players. Why? Because you get a free system out of it and a unique racial trait. Never underestimate these because a single good trait can win you the game. There's also pirates. It's okay. Everybody finds me irresistible. <laughs> I assume there's some sort of universal translator that's just sort of in game doing some trolling. Pirates exist to occupy every system you ever like and reduce the overall quality of your time and space. Luckily, pirates are business oriented and will not trouble you as long as you pay. Also, I like putting pirate marks on all of my friends' colonies. Consider it an indirect way of saying maybe you should move. Now you've got the basics down. What are you? That is actually pretty fun, and it reflects a reality. The stereotype is pirates or even people like narcos or uh, drug gangs is that they are just inhuman killers. And the truth is that while there are definitely people in those organizations that are psychopaths who won't bat an eye at killing, the larger organization is existing to make money. Right? This isn't like a terror organization that exists to further some sort of ideological goal or engage in, in, in conflict for conflict's sake. Right, They are there to make money, and they are succeeding if no one dies and everyone gets paid. So it means that you can negotiate with a business organization because you understand how the organization thinks. It thinks about itself as a profit-making enterprise. Right, This is actually one of my favorite stories. And you can see it now. Look at the cartel that threatened the U.S. avocado inspector, right? This is a avocado inspector that was going to deny a load. It was going to cost the cartel a lot of money. And so they threatened the inspector to say, you're going to let these black or gray market avocados pass. The inspector was like, you can't threaten me. I'm an agent of the U.S. government. Uh, and so they went back to the U.S. and said, hey, I was threatened. This load is not going to be approved. And the government, the U.S. government, to their immense credit, was like, don't threaten our staff. We bring in no avocados and we will let this entire crop across the entire Mexican border. This, these will all rot. And they did it. For two weeks, those avocados sat in probably a warehouse somewhere and just rotten away. Millions and millions of dollars. And here's the thing. The cartels almost certainly got the message. Because the message is the U.S. inspectors are here for the health of the public. Sometimes they deny a load. But if you want some avocados to make it through, you need to play ball. And that means shutting up and listening when we tell you these avocados aren't going to move, right? And here's, here's the thing, the cartels almost certainly listened. In fact, they almost certainly listened and they almost certainly killed the guy who made that threat, right? Because look at the cost, right? They Sure, maybe there was, let's say there is a 50% chance that that threat would have succeeded and that, that avocado load went through and they would have made $1 million in profit, awesome. But they now lost like a hundred million dollars in avocado sales. So I'm using these numbers speculatively, but I think it's probably about a hundred to one. You lose, so yeah, a million dollar loss, but it backfired and became a hundred million dollar loss. This is unbelievable amounts of money and for very little benefit. So these organizations, while they have individuals that are stupid, they engage in cost-benefit analysis and they understand that the benefits of playing the game as it's supposed to be played go a long way. And this is true of almost every sort of pirate type operation. You meant to do pirate, criminal, gray market, any money-making operation is going to be open to this sort of 
arrangement. Tube. You're meant to try and you're meant to fail. Endless Space Tube gives you freedom. Freedom to fuck up and suffer the consequences. The tech tree is subdivided into four distinct categories. Military, economy, science, and empire. Develop your military and you get bigger guns, but you don't get the ships to mount them. You need to develop your empire for that. Then you need a military industrial complex to facilitate the production of your armada, which forces you to tech economy, not only for developing your systems, but for supplying a constant stream of dust, because bankruptcy is not an option. For reference, one technology unlock is the difference between abject poverty and having the largest intergalactic wish.com, sweatshop prime, trade company, AliExpress, love it. Love it. Operated on your home system. Why stop there? Get access to the galactic commodities market as well, because it's a biological requirement for me to speculate the stock market in every game I play. Do uh, you left. There is actually a lot of evidence that gambling and gambling like behavior it does have a biological basis, right? Just in the same way, many people say, "Hey, alcoholism runs in my family." The there may also be a biological. Um, predisposition to gambling style reward pathways and th this is called an intermittent reward schedule where the rewards are intermittent and interspersed with losses that emotional feeling of going up and down and up and down and then winning is so intoxicating uh, that it literally hijacks the brain in much the same way substance abuse does and so we think that there actually is some sort of biological pathway that encourages it um, I will tell you I am from a family of uh, not usually like gambling themselves into bankruptcy, but a family that enjoys deeply uh, games of chance. And, you know, I'm cognizant of that, that I enjoy risk taking, uh, calculated risk taking, but I try really hard to not engage. Uh, not engage in things like sports betting or casino gambling. And when I do it, it's things like investments and business ventures and stocks and equities and that sort of thing. That's how I try to scratch that itch. Um, but I'll tell you, it's, it's, it's there. And I really think there is a genetic basis to it. Do all that and realize you neglected science, which is a problem because every single research you ever research makes every following research more expensive to research. Endless Space 2 is a great galactic scale balancing act. Every action taken is counterbalanced by the opportunity cost of every action not taken. Here's an example. Let's say you found a nice system. Okay, Seth, a man after my heart knows about opportunity cost. If you understand opportunity cost or the, the fact that you have to give up the next best thing to do the thing you want to do with your time, resources, energy, or effort, then you know that uh, this is a man who knows, well, how to, how to manage their time, right? If you understand opportunity cost, then you can understand things about time management. But you can't colonize it because each type of planet requires the respective technology to touch ground on their surface. You might spend a bunch of turns teching towards that. As a result, you get a new system. However, your lack of tech leaves you oblivious to the contents. You later find out that ideal Mediterranean planet you picked is filled with dinosaurs, the water is made of mercury, and the <laughs> atmosphere gives you cancer. If you pumped everything into science and exploration, you would have found a much better system nearby. Because you explored the curiosities, you know there's plenty of strategic deposits without the risk of melanoma. Even the worst colony has great potential. Given a development plan, systems can compensate for deficiency using luxury. Low birth rate? Spike the water with red sang. No production? Use jadonics. Do people still keep using the term war criminal in your presence? Despite the fact you've clarified multiple times that enemy civilians are indeed active combatants bring out the hallucinogenic grapes Give <laughs> oh man ah uh, this is great dude this is this is so realistic i should play this game this seems like a lot of fun okay wow we are at 35 minutes guys and we are only 10 <laughs> minutes into this set video guys this is gonna have to be a this is gonna have to be a multi-parter i think let's uh let's just pause it right there man Guys, this has been awesome. First, let me know in the comments if you want me to uh, keep going, get this thing done. Because um, you know I love exploration games, and I love Seth, and I love the fact that Seth really, this game and Seth understand how 
how like empire management works and i use empire in the little e sense right like amazon is an empire uh any corporation is an empire a big organization is an empire right how to make these multi-layered hierarchies function and how to navigate them right it's very slow it's ponderous and it requires a lot of thought and that's if you are a dictator right if you imagine having to do this game by committee that's how most corporations and empires are run anyway guys thank you so much for joining me on this first off be sure to follow me on twitch twitch.tv slash combat that paul also Big thanks to our Lieutenant Tier patrons, Cole Foster, Caffeinated, Chris, Command Unit, Jakob Flavius, and Dr. Shadow Cop. Uh, these guys have access to the exclusive rooms on the Discord. Uh, they get access to exclusive bonus content on the Patreon. Uh, they actually get to vote because Lieutenant Tier patrons actually get to vote and provide input on what that bonus content looks like. And yeah, it's the one-stop shop for whatever you want. So anyway, guys, thanks for joining me. Thanks again to Manscaped for sponsoring today's video, and I'll see you guys in the next one.